Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Man, glory to God. Thanks, Nikki, for that uh, that selection. Amen. And we'll be looking at uh, Joshua chapter chapters nine and ten. <clears throat> and that selection uh, from Nikki goes well with this. <clears throat> yes, God will stop time. He will stop time to make lives beautiful. When God pronounced a judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, he used the help of angels to carry it out. However, to execute judgment upon the Canaanites, he used Joshua and the Israelites. The promised land, or the land of the Canaanites, were lands that Israel's ancestors had already occupied, but left when migrating to Egypt because of the famine. But in their absence, other tribes had taken over and resorted to all types of evil practices that God wanted to clear out and then had that land sanctified for himself again. So Joshua and the Israelites, after the death of Moses, were on mission to fulfill the will of God. Up to this point, they defeated the army at Jericho, where the walls came tumbling down. And they defeated the army at Ai in an ambush after having first lost the initial attack due to sin in their own ranks. So we'll pick up in Joshua chapter 9 in the first verse, starting there. It says that when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, and these things being the defeat of Jericho and Ai, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. Verse 3. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. We see that many of the kings formed an alliance at an international conference to discuss how to take on Israel, knowing that Israel's mission was to purge the land. The nations, though, had often fought against each other and had different agendas, but they came together on this occasion because they saw the coming day of judgment and decided to lay aside their differences and try to agree on a response to an existential threat. But the Gibeonites, they saw the folly of the entire enterprise at the conference and wanted no part of what they saw as a sure path to death, to death and defeat. They wanted to strike out on their own and make a deal. This was startling because if anyone had a chance at defeating the Israelites, it would have been the Gibeonites who were well positioned to successfully defend themselves with the army of valiant men housed in a fortified city on a hill, making it difficult to attack. But they saw the hopelessness of fighting, broke away from the alliance, and created a separate pact with the Israelites. They came to the conclusion that resistance was futile against it was futile because they had reviewed the details of the battles that Israel waged against Jericho and Ai. And they never contemplated that the humiliating defeat in the initial attack on Ai could have been a sign of their weakness that they could now exploit. No, they saw that humiliation on Israel's part as they're part of a grand master plan to defeat Ai, and that Israel's psychological warfare and discipline 
to pull off such a well thought out plan was simply stunning. The Gibeonites, their historical analysis of that war concluded that the Israelites intended to lose the initial battle against Ai to make the enemy overconfident. And then at the second attempt to take that city, as expected, all of Ai went after Israel, leaving behind no protection whatsoever. They, the men of Ai, saying to themselves, we can easily mop up these guys with no problem. Let's have some fun, boys, like, and let's do this again. And so the Gibeonites must have been thinking, how do you fool seasoned warriors like Ai like that? Israel must have been expert strategists, expert warriors. The Gibeonites saw that Ai was so caught up in the, their false belief that Israel was a bunch of losers that they didn't even take the basic principles of warfare into consideration in covering their rear guard. They exposed themselves to total destruction, which Israel capitalized on in an ambush. The Gibeonites saw this victory as pure genius. But in retrospect, from God's perspective, God took the original failure of Israel, that failure to defeat Ai, a failure when they cried like a baby and boo-hooed down on the ground all day long, feeling sorry for themselves, wanting to give up the fight so soon. God took that failure. God took that failure of the Israelites and in the minds of the Gibeonites wove that same image of defeat into an overall strategy that made it look like to them, to the Gibeonites, a thing of beauty. This means for us then that God can, in full view of others, and in our own minds, he can take the scars of our lives, take the scars of our past failures, and times when we felt totally defeated, those times when we also boo-hooed and cried like a baby, he can take those scars and weave them together into a tapestry full of his blessings and create in us a life full of beauty, as if they were a part, those failures were a part of his original plan. Amen. And if you can no longer, this, this picture that God presents, he makes it so beautiful, just weaving together the failure with all of his blessings and make that, that life's picture so beautiful that you can no longer tell where the scars end and the blessings begin. The Gibeonites, given their view of what transpired and the view of their destiny, they saw that their only recourse was to withdraw from the international alliance with those Canaanites and to form their own separate alliance with Israel. So by deception, they sent a delegation to Joshua, pretending to be from a faraway country. They dressed as if they had traveled some distance and packed provisions to look as if the food had spoiled from the long journey. And they asked Joshua to enter into a treaty between those, the two countries. And when Joshua asked who they were, verse 9, it says they answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, Sion, king of Heshbon, ah, oh, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtoreth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Make a treaty with us. So Joshua and the leaders ratified the treaty. But it didn't take long before Joshua found out that the Gibeonites were actually neighbors. And he confronted them about their deceit. And he said, 
And they said to him, verse 24, your servants are clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant, Moses, to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is, what, that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right in your sight. And it was clear that they were on the wrong side of the Lord. And to their credit, they wanted to get right. But we see that God can make your enemies bow down before you without you having to fire a shot or raise a shout or lift a finger. And so Joshua spared them like he did Rahab after the fall of Jericho and hired them basically as subcontractors. And now when I look at the rapid pace of progress being made today, it's phenomenal. It's more like a move of God than results of any one group doing anything. This is a move of God. And what was once unthinkable only a few months ago is actually happening right now. Mississippi is changing its Confederate flag. Stonewall Jackson schools are being renamed. Police officers are being fired, not because of their racist actions, that is true, but because of their racist speech even, that they thought was private. And above all, the Redskins football team is changing its name. And now all around the globe, people are walking, are waking up to the fact that racism is real and that it can be called out and attacked. Even now, Ghana has a tourism campaign to capitalize on the focus of racism in America to bring black Americans, as they see it, bring them back home. And the ones who are going there, and some blacks are going there, they're in a position to build fabulous homes in the capital city of Ghana. This is great progress for blacks since that, black, that Back to Africa movement unto Marcus Garvey at the beginning of the last century when blacks were too poor to make a move like that. But a lot of thanks now goes to President Trump, who according to one black author and professor, did more to force a national reckoning on race relations in this country than Barack Obama. Because the current president is presenting a stark contrast between people who are fighting for a more perfect union and the mighty fine people who are part of the various white supremacist groups. And more and more of America is waking up, they're seeing up close the ugliness of racism, unaware of how prevalent it was before and saying this is not the country we want to be like. This is not us. But critics who don't want to deal with the situation at hand, that black lives actually do matter, will point out failures that exist in the black community and say, aha, what about this? If black lives matter, what about black on black crime? If, if black lives matter, what about black on white crime? What about high arrest and incarceration rates? Even some immigrants have been taught to have racist views. And they might say, if blacks only work harder, they could get ahead. Well, at the same time, they accept the fact that they too will face prejudices. But their view is that you shouldn't resist, you shouldn't protest, you should just accept it and work harder. Not understanding that being in an environment of constant reminders day in and day out that you don't belong here. Those reminders can foster in some communities a deep sense of hopelessness and despair and depression with bitter outcomes. The thing is though that over time, the atypical waves of crime, and this is not normal, this is just what the media hypes from time to time to get a point across, but over time, 
the atypical ways of crime in the black community will be woven into the progress of events unfolding before us and they'll blend into the background and then fade away. It'll fade away by us keeping the focus on getting the job done of building a more perfect union. For Joshua, by letting the initial defeat by AI fade into the background, he was able to continue to get the job done of purging the land of sin. But what follows is a twist on divine intervention. Joshua chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. Another alliance being formed. Joshua 10, verse 1. Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, just like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all his men were good fighters. So the king of Jerusalem formed another alliance with four other kings, and their combined armies went up to attack Gibeon because they knew that they could not defeat the, 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 the divinely protected Israel. So they wanted to at least peel off any support that Israel could get from Gibeon. And the attack was probably intended to send a message to the other city-states that they should not go into league with Israel or the five kings will go after them. And verse 6, the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us. Help us. Because all the kings, the Amorite kings from the hill country, have joined forces against us. And so Joshua took all of his fighting men and marched all night and under cover of early dawn caught the invading army by surprise. But what was unique about this divine intervention is that it doesn't seem like Joshua really needed help. But let's get down to verse 10. When Israel attacked, it said that the Lord threw them the enemy, the invading army, into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Verse 11. And they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah. The Lord hailed, hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. And going further. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky, and delayed going down about a full day. First confusion then hailstorm. God was giving Joshua victory after victory in defeating the alliance in battle. And Joshua didn't, he didn't want to get sidetracked or to take a break from getting the job done. So he commanded the sun to, and the moon to just stand still, hold their positions in the sky so that they could have a little bit more daylight hours to keep at it, to keep fighting without slowing down or having to finish up another day. So when God is working, stay with him. Keep at it. Don't get sidetracked. Don't, don't take a break. Keep going. And for one, don't give up because of failures. Don't give up because of failures that we may encounter because failure will blend into God's overall plan for our lives. And two, don't feel bad about receiving so many of God's blessings, one after the other. Don't feel like because God is blessing you so much, something bad has got to happen. 
No, believe that it's really happening. And like Joshua, keep going until you get the job done. Keep going. And so in the right, in the fight for righteousness and justice, in the fight for righteousness and justice, with all the changes that we see taking place, it's okay to keep fighting. Don't say this is enough. Don't say something bad is going to happen. It's okay to keep reaching for more blessings from the Lord until the fight is finished. It's okay to reach for more name changes, to reach for more statues to fall, to reach for more police reforms, to reach for more job protections, to reach for more access to clean drinking water, for more access to better foods, for better health care. It's okay to keep reaching until we reach for a more equitable and just society for everyone. And ask God, just like Joshua, just ask God, God, keep the fire burning. Keep the sun shining. Hallelujah. Keep the movement going until these things happen, until the job is finally done. Glory, hallelujah. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Let's just keep going. Bless the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, do thank you for this time you've given to us. Thank you, dear Lord God. Thank you, dear Lord God. Thank you, dear Lord God. Be with us, Lord. Keep us uh, ever faithful, keep us ever strong, keep us ever fighting for you, keep us ever fighting for what's right. Dear Lord God, keep us in the fight to do what's right. Glory, glory to your holy name, God. And just continue to pour out your spirit all around this land, all around us. Continue to pour out your spirit in whatever you have to Hallelujah. do. Hallelujah. Bring us, all of us, the country, to its knees. Continue to do it, dear Lord God, till we cry out to you. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Hallelujah. Glory to your holy name, God. Glory to your holy name. Glory to your holy name. Glory to you, God. Glory to you, God. Glory to you, God.